There's no question that interest in Yiddish culture and specifically in, in studying Yiddish language um, is on the rise. It's a drinking song to social justice. Uh, Yiddish is now marking its millennium. What's that? Mazel tov. <laughs> Well, as far as the influence of uh, Yiddish on English, it certainly seems like uh, the influence is growing all the time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Shlemiel, Shlemazel, Hassan Beth Incorporated. Uh, Renaissance is a big word. Uh, re renewal of interest, yeah. Apparently there's this whole Judeophilia that's happening in Italy, and Italians are all studying Yiddish and, you know, listening to klezmer music. <laughs> Hundreds of uh, amateur and professional uh, bands of non Jews playing classical music with names like the Goyim. <laughs> through the media, through comedians, presumably, there are so many Yiddish words that are at least known to a certain segment of the English speaking population. And I guess that's going to keep increasing. What's Korean for suicide? <laughs> that's the Japanese. We don't do that shtick. There's all these words that kind of manage to survive. Um, and they become popular enough and people keep using them, um, the number should increase for, for a while, I would think. Word schmuck. Now, in Germany, schmuck means jewel. That's why the, the, um, the term schmuck is for the male organ, your family jewels, as it were. Yiddish is derived from a combination, an interesting one, of various medieval German dialects, um, Hebrew, Aramaic, Slavic, primarily Polish, and small elements of Old French and Old Italian. It carries with it a built-in history of Jewish experience of a thousand years. Religious history, folk history, uh, uh, literary history, musical history. The earliest popular collection of Yiddish folk tales is the Meisebuch, and that was, that appeared in the 17th Century. When I heard cluster music, to me it sounded like the, uh, the musical abstraction of the Yiddish language. It sounded like the Yiddish language without words. You know, my man, you're a genius. Mm, I love my work. There were the humorous tales about wits and nitwits. These religious tunes, which were then sped up and turned into dance tunes by the Klesmora, who were apparently a fairly irreverent bunch. <laughs> Get out of here, you little bitches. And then there are the stories that are more like the international fairy tale. Only we don't have fairies, we have elves in the Yiddish tales. Yes, interest in Yiddish has definitely increased. Um, active use, mm, a little bit, a little bit. The title in Italian is Mazel Tov, and I wish I had thought of that title <laughs> for the English translation. When Jews moved from the Germanic provinces, what we used to be called the Ro Holy Roman Empire, to the Slavic countries, they took with them a preformed language, added the Slavic elements, and now we have an amalgam of Germanic, Hebraic, Hebrew and Aramaic, and Slavic elements. And it was also translated into Japanese. Oh, in the old country, klezmer musicians played, for the most part, violin was really the main instrument. Also the cymbal, which is a Jewish hammer dulcimer, played like that. Um, bowed bass, double bass, uh, wooden flute. In the 19th century, when, I guess, military bands were popular, uh, Jews started playing the trumpet, trombone, uh, an instrument called the puk, which is a portable drum set. It's a cymbal up here and a, a bass drum here. She had been born and raised in the backwoods of northern Poland, uh, an area of, I heard her mention cities like uh, Malawa, and Prusznitz, and Czechachinik. They were in the northwestern uh, part of the country. And in this country, when the big waves of immigration brought lots of Jews here, our grandparents and great grandparents, the clarinet became a much more important klezmer instrument, and uh, the trap drum set came into the bands, and uh, piano, accordion. Uh, emigrated in mass and in 
leftover batches uh, to America, north and south, to Israel, to South Africa, and uh, have carried the language and the culture with them. My grandfather, Sam Shapiro, who came from Galicia, uh, Polish, Austria, and, and Europe, in 1899 uh, to Attorney Street and opened a restaurant. I was born and lived in the Lower East Side until the age of seven, actually on 2nd Street between Avenue B and Avenue C. The, the things that we go to the supermarket for today were purchased on the push carts of the Lower East Side. My real name isn't Krusty the Clown. It's Herschel Kristofsky. My father was a rabbi. His father was a rabbi. His father's father... Well, you get the idea. My father was the most respected man in the Lower East Side of Springfield. <laughs> it was so Jewish that I actually didn't have any knowledge of English until I started kindergarten. The neighborhood was all Yiddish-speaking. 